Michelle and I have known each other for about seven years now, and we first met through the awesome organization um, when I was still the co-chief procurement officer at Danaher. And at that time, uh, you were just buying your company, Hassett Logistics, right, Michelle? That's right, Heather. Uh, probably the ink was still drying on the agreement because that happened in October of 2013. Um, yeah, and it's been and it's been great getting to know you since then, and we've kind of both evolved in our positions. And now, seven years later, uh, you're on the Awesome Advisory board, board, and I've joined the Hassett Advisory Board. Yes, you have. And that is, uh, I'm glad we're talking leadership today, because that was one of my 2020 goals, was to start an advisory board, and I really appreciate you being part of it. I, I really enjoy it, and I enjoy doing work with you. Um, today, we're going to talk about leadership and logistics in what we're calling the next normal. Um, and uh, Michelle, given her role leading a transportation organization, um, is going to talk more about the operational aspects of leadership during this, this uh, kind of unusual period with the pandemic and quarantine. And I'm going to talk a little bit more academically from my um, recent university teaching perspective. So I think, um, Michelle, I'll, I'll let you get us started. Great. Let me ask you for the first question. So kind of from a broad perspective, what are you seeing out there with supply chains as far as what happened during the pandemic and when the quarantine hit? Uh, kind of a big picture view of why you think maybe there were some uh, failures in supply chain. Well, you know, different companies all had different circumstances and, and, and are continuing to deal with those. Uh, for some companies, demand just spiked up. For other companies, demand completely dropped off. Um, some had workforce that was no longer available for a variety of reasons. Um, some were required to shut down production because uh, they were not, not an essential business. Um, but the similarity for most is that they were traditional supply chains. Um, and that means that they've been focused on lean and cost, uh, centered on tier one suppliers, um, have very long planning horizons, uh, typically limited technology investments, basically not equipped to handle disruptions. And so there's not a lot of flexibility or resilience in most supply chains because supply chain traditionally has been considered a cost center um, as opposed to something that really elevates and, and provides to its end customers. Um, the good news is that that's starting to change. Um, let me ask you a question. How about you? How has Hassett been uh, impacted by the pandemic? Um, how have your business and your teams been affected? Uh, how have you continued to lead maybe in a more remote way? Well, <laughs> thanks. Yeah, to say it's been interesting would be a huge understatement, of course. Um, for those that don't know who Hassett Logistic is, let me just set the stage here. Uh, we are a primary player in the domestic air freight market. We also provide 3PL services, and we've been a trucking carrier for over 40 years. So like every business out there, when the pandemic hit, we were hit, we were kind of faced with making a lot of very quick decisions that were going to be impactful, and doing that in light of very little data and kind of changing information, it seemed like, on a daily basis. So we decided uh, really to focus in three key areas. First and foremost, of course, was our team. The safety and health of our team uh, was our main driver. At, at the same time, it was understanding our customers' needs at that time. And I'll touch on kind of our customer segments, but what did they expect of us and, and what would we have to be able to do during that period? And then that obviously leads into our partners. How did, would we work even closer with primarily our airline and our ground partners to support those customer needs? So when we first look at people, since we are also a carrier, we could not just send everyone home and work remotely. Uh, when you have drivers and dispatchers and warehouse folks, you have to find a way to accommodate that. And while we were really happy to be considered an essential business, uh, that brought some, some risks and, and issues just, just in that space. So we did send as many people as we could home across our system, and they worked remotely uh, from home. Uh, but then at the same time, we kind of looked at our facilities and looked at what did we need to do to improve 
our procedures in face of the new CDC guidelines. And luckily we have some pretty strong processes in place. And in some cases we exceeded the guidelines coming out. Uh, I like to joke that I would have never imagined having to buy electrostatic sprayers, but that's exactly what we did for our facilities to work during that period in time. So that helped keep our team together. Uh, and then we looked at our customers and we handle three main areas. And the first I'll talk about is event logistics. So concerts, entertainment, sports events, trade shows, you kind of get the feel here. Anything where there were crowds, we were in that space. So obviously that piece of business kind of just shut the doors immediately, very quickly, like a faucet going off. And our other two areas of business uh, obviously were impacted, but they had some, some surprising success come out of them. One of those being specialized projects, and that's where we might have uh, month-long rollouts or multi-month planning of store rollouts or improvements, things like that. Surprisingly, that started coming back pretty quickly, and it's been strong. And then the third area, uh, which is probably near and dear to everybody's hearts, is e-commerce. We were pretty deep into that space for a number of years, and that just took off. You know, there's a little slight dip and then started going crazy, of course, uh, and set that against what was happening with the industry at the time. Uh, that became quite challenging, and that's where our partners came in place to, to try to help handle that. Um, and I like to use the lemon lemonade analogy. So what we did, so we had this one group of people in our company that basically had no work to do. So we were, our, our commitment was to quickly cross train them in some of the other areas where they could help support our other teams. And that was fairly easy to do since most of our processes are consistent across groups. So they just had to get some customer account specific information and were able to come up to speed. And then we were able to also allocate some resources to our technology initiatives uh, because at the same time in the spring, we were just kicking off uh, our move to replace our transportation management system. So there's a lot going on all at the same time. I would say one of the things about remote leadership and what we've learned is communication obviously is even more critical. Uh, we spent a lot of time giving updates to our employees, both on what was happening with the co company, but what was happening in the world, uh, just trying to ease their fears a little bit and, and concerns. The one thing I wanted to make sure they understood is don't worry about your job. Don't worry about HACCP. Jobs are safe, companies safe. Take that off your worry list and, and focus on yourselves. So that's kind of where we stood. Mm -hmm. I'd be curious to turn that around and ask you though. Um, so that's what we were dealing with within HACCP. But when you look at leadership overall, where do you think the leaders and managers in general should be focusing right now? And then also preparing themselves for the, the midterm and future challenges that are certainly coming. Well, I think, you know, one of the things that makes you a great leader and one of the reasons I like working with you, Michelle, is because you you are uh, really effective at communicating. Um, because I, I noticed that in your organization. I noticed the way you deal with uh, those of us that are on the outside of your organization as well. And that, I think, is one of the keys to uh, where leaders and managers need to focus right now. Um, there, but there are three things. I think it's communication. I think it's talent. And I think it's problem solving. So, you know, first the communication, you've already said it, but, you know, leaders have to be open and vulnerable, really, in their communication in order to balance kind of optimism and realism, um, you know, and be honest about where, where you have answers and where you don't have answers. Um, the second thing is that the, is, is around hiring, developing good talent. I think having people on board that are critical thinkers and problem solvers, that is the second area where leaders and managers have to focus. Um, and then the problem solving, really defining, having great discipline around uh, def definition of a problem, really understanding root causes of a problem. I think that's where you empower that great talent to do the work and have them um, create the solutions. So one of the things I want to mention is that I hear and read a lot about uh, everybody talking tech and automation and digitization, um, but those are just tools. Those should never be seen as the end goal in and of themselves, just to automate something. Um, you really have to use the technology 
um, to solve your well-defined problem that your great talented people are working on. So I think that's an important um, uh, element uh, to take into consideration. But I really think it comes down to focus on communication, talent, and um, problem solving. So Michelle, I want to ask you a question. You mentioned that your e-commerce volumes were way up. And we, we sort of all saw that happen. We were all at home. We started order, we ordered so much more online. Um, but how did you handle it in your organization? Did you accept the new volumes? Did you have to turn some away? And as the leader, what was your decision-making process around that? Good question. Uh, I'd like to say I had a really complex decision-making process, uh, but it was pretty simple. It's kind of the attitude we've always had at Hassett, which is bring it. We knew there were these surges, and we really try hard to never say no. So we worked closely with our customers, and we certainly worked closely with the airlines to make it happen. Uh, as you recall, back in uh, April going into May, the airlines dropped their capacity by 70 to 80 percent. So here we are having this mini peak starting, and there's no capacity. So we got very creative, and I think that's where, you know, working a lot and very closely with airlines over decades and working with our customers for a very long time, we were able to communicate very clearly, very detailed, and we were able to actually take care of the volume. And it takes, it goes back to a point you just made about people. I like to think we have a team of problem solvers. And they jumped in and knew that, you know, they could look at ways. We had some great processes, but how could we tweak that? How could we challenge ourselves to handle it a little differently? And that's where they really came through, and we were able to make it happen. Now, was a performance 100%? No, we took some hits, but we still kept a pretty good performance throughout, and it has, has bounced back uh, to, to very high levels. Really? So that's key, right? Yeah. It is like a peak, yes. Um, so let me ask you, I'll, I'll change the, the focus a little bit and talk on leadership in general. So you've been leading Awesome now for about three years, right? And I'm sure there's a lot of lessons you've learned and observations you've made through that experience, if you could share a few. Yeah, I guess the, um, you know, the thing that I have really learned through my experience leading Awesome is the impact of diversity. It was, you know, it, it, diversity has always been something that that we agreed was was important. It was a little bit like motherhood and apple pie. There was no way to argue with it. But there was also, uh, it didn't feel like there was a lot of hard science behind the value of diversity. Um, but now there, it, it's very clear. There's been a lot of work and a lot of research that really demonstrates that diversity is the performance accelerator. Um, there's there, there, some of the research to back it up is, and, and I want to get these numbers right. So I'm going to look at my notes. Better decisions are made 73% of the time from gender diverse teams and better decisions are made 87% of the time from broadly diverse teams. That's a really big kicker to performance. So I, you know, I think we all want to amplify the effects of our problem solving um, and so we've, we've got to create and empower more diverse work teams based on all dimensions of diversity from race, gender, age, personality. Um, there, there are more dimensions than that even. Uh, so that's, I think, the really key uh, thing that I've learned in leading, leading Awesome for the, for the past three years. And you, you've owned Hassett for about seven years now. And you know, what have been some of your leadership lessons? What, what advice can you share with the, uh, with the pe people listening here today? Let me think of a few things here. Um, I think one of the things, you, and again, you've touched upon it, is when you look at talent, you look at people. I've come to believe more strongly than ever that you hire for attitude. Uh, we can teach specific skills, and skills change. But that attitude, kind of how people are wired, and in our world, that means uh, taking accountability being that problem solver, being curious, uh, and, and, and kind of taking ownership of it and really being proud of the work you do. That is, is one of the key things. And we nurture that both in our, our existing employees, plus as we're doing new hires. Um, I also can't overstate the need for trust in building relationships. Uh, and, and that has seen us through a lot of hard times, in, in, including the most recent events. 
And when I talk trust, uh, one of the books I read, it really resonated with me, is that trust is not built in these big moments, you know, that, that something happens. Trust is built over time in the small moments. And that's how you also build the relationships. And I think building trust in that way sets us up for success when things like this happen. Um, so that's been very uh, important to us. And then the other thing I would mention just on a personal thing is I think I've learned to become better at rocking the boat. I never, I kind of avoided that in the past. And uh, since taking over ownership almost seven years ago, I've learned that that is healthy. It's it's good to do in the, in the right way, of course, but everything from uh, maybe redirecting how we focus in, on customers, what kind of new segments we're going to go after, um, the kind of talent we do want to bring on, and, and even going as far as changing our company name, which we're going through a rebranding, and this is the week we're changing the name. So not being afraid to try things like that. I think those those are important leadership things. And my advice would be if, if people learn it earlier in their career, that's even better. I like to call that executive courage. You have executive courage. <laughs> See, you have a nice professional term for it. So that's why you are so <laughs> successful in academics. Uh, and I guess I'll stick to uh, day-to-day operations. Um, but that's great. But let me pose one final question to you. Um, and it gets into projections. You know, we've been through a lot in 2020. What would you like to see? What's a good thing you would hope would come as a result of everything we've been facing here this year? Well, you know, certainly I hope there would be a a, a real impactful acceleration of diversity in in our businesses. Uh, I, I certainly hope that to be the case. But there are a couple of other things that I think are opportunities to come out of this the challenges of 2020. Um, their, their first one is uh, there are some real efficiencies to doing work virtually. Where you can, where it doesn't require being in person, I really hope that a lot of those efficiencies of virtual work stick for the longer term. So I think there's some real value in that um, for, for, for getting things done and being more productive. The other thing is that I think we've got a big opportunity to invest public and private funds into our transportation infrastructure. It's it's really badly needed. You probably know better than I do even how badly needed that is in the U.S. Um, And this is a great time to put people to work um, making those infrastructure improvements. So I hope that that's something that uh, will, that, that those are the things that will come out of the challenges of 2020. That's wonderful. Uh, Well stated. And I support you all the way on infrastructure improvements, especially if that would help with congestion at airports. Absolutely. That brings us to a good ending. What do you think? Yeah, this was a lot of fun. Um, As always, it was great talking to you. Um, I hope we'll get a chance to do it in person again soon. (laughs) Absolutely. It was great talking to you too. And uh, fun sharing some information back and forth. Thanks. Thanks everyone for for listening today.